Welcome to Tomorrow is the Problem, a podcast from ICA Miami's Art and Research Center, where we approach urgent issues of our time by unearthing the hidden meanings behind everyday phenomenon and ask how they might help us build a more liberated future. I'm your host, Donna Honarpiche, and this season we're thinking about the ocean as a site of knowledge. In our last episode, The Sea is Future, we brought you to the Afrofuturist capital of Drexia, where the forced relocations that took place in the Middle Passage culminated in not only survival, but a thriving metropolis, with inhabitants who created their own techno-forward aquatic world. We thought about how the ocean, with all its ecological and fantastical wonder, creates a space for speculation alongside our own timeline, and how those present futures help us better understand the past. But not everyone sees Drexia's nautical Afrofuturism as a source of strength. We, the mundane Afrofuturists, being alternately pissed off and bored, need a means of asserting a different set of values to begin imagining the future. In 2013, American artist Martine Sims published the mundane Afrofuturist manifesto. The world Sims describes is not born of the cosmos or an underwater realm, nor does it believe freedom would be possible in either arena. The world Sims imagines is the present, the concrete reality we live and breathe in, and it is here on this planet that Sims guides us to seek liberation. The mundane Afrofuturists recognize that we did not originate in the cosmos. The connection between middle passage and space travel is tenuous at best. Out of 534 space travelers, 14 have been black. An all-black crew is unlikely. Magic interstellar travel and or the wondrous communication grid can lead to the illusion that all people are treated equally in outer space and cyberspace. Outer space will not save us from injustice, and cyberspace was founded on a master-slave relationship. While we are often othered, we are not aliens. While our ancestors were mutilated, we are not mutants. Post-black is a misnomer. Post-colonialism is a misnomer. Instead of seeking refuge in speculation, Sims attunes us to the secret codes of localized cultural practices drawn from the rituals and struggles of our everyday realities. These are practices that don't only imagine another world, but can be translated into concrete action that leads to collective liberation. Because, according to Sims, the most likely future is one in which we only have ourselves and this planet. In today's episode, we're taking a cue from Sims and attending to the here and now. We're going to look not above or down below, but at the edge, the line where the sea meets the shore, and examining what happens when that threshold gets crossed, as it was when enslaved Africans were forcefully brought across the Atlantic, and today, when migrants around the world cross choppy waters to flee foreign-imposed wars, state violence, and climate disaster. What do these crossings mean for the sea itself, the people who cross it, and the places they come ashore? We'll approach these questions through the work of two incredible writers and thinkers, a novelist and a poet perched on two different coasts, and whose work contends with two different transoceanic crises, to see where it converges and what we can learn from it. The five-year migration crisis, especially in the Mediterranean and Atlantic, continues unabated, with drowning deaths now on the rise. Italy is warning it needs more help to deal with the surge in the number of migrants arriving there via boat from Libya amid reports there are tens of thousands waiting to cross the Mediterranean. The main gate Stranded the in the middle of the Atlantic, a helpless migrant boat. The Spanish military helicopters overhead have never spotted anything like this here. It's 300 miles from shore. They realize there are many bodies. At the time of this writing, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees estimates that just under 2 million migrants and refugees crossed what has become known as the world's deadliest border, 
to land on the shores of Italy, Greece, Spain, Cyprus, and Malta since 2015, the beginning of the so-called migrant crisis. Which I refer to as a crisis of European identity, where they do not make room for perceived other people and use the borders of, of their own nation states to sort of demarcate who is the self and who is the other. S.A. Smythe is a poet, translator, and scholar of African-American and gender studies at UCLA. We spoke to them while they were on academic leave in Rome, writing their upcoming book on the Black Mediterranean and producing a new piece of sound art called Junkanu Dreams. For three and a twelve o'clock, traveling we lost through all kinds of means, adorn new rivers to no end. Who questions? The marine mammals? Guam. Essay's work contemplates Black identity and belonging outside of national borders. Which is to say, oceans don't have borders. And in fact, they don't have the same kind of borders that nation states put on them. But there have been periods of, in the last, say, five or six years, for example, 2016 and 2017, that saw a drastic increase in the people that were trying to migrate into Europe, into the European Union, by traversing the Mediterranean Sea who were effectively let to drown or who were not rescued by Italian Coast Guard operations because they said that those seas belonged to Malta, for example. Or Malta would say they belonged to Spain, or Spain would say but they belonged to France, right? So you see where nation-states' idea of borders, which is referred to as border regimes, actually gets in the way of the very human fact that the people who are on boats are not following cartographic realities, right? They're not aware of, well, I'm currently on this part of an international sea because the sea themselves do not know borders. Essay considers the crisis through the lens of something called the Black Mediterranean. In our last episode, we explored the idea of the Black Atlantic, a phrase coined by Paul Gilroy in the early 90s to describe the shared Black diasporic identity that has emerged in the wake of the transatlantic slave trade. Alessandra de Mayo started using the phrase the Black Mediterranean to think about Black diasporic identity in other oceanic contexts and to consider Gilroy's idea that oceans act as a space and a mechanism for cross-cultural identity. As de Mayo put it, The term focuses on the proximity that exists and has always existed between Italy and Africa, separated but also united by the Mediterranean and documented in legends, myths, histories, even in culinary traditions, in visual arts and religion. In other words, the Black Mediterranean encompasses the movement and experiences of people who traverse the Mediterranean Sea as an answer to the more familiar narrative of Black diasporic experience through the Atlantic framework. So thinking about the Black Mediterranean in this oceanic way also then allows us to say, let's attend fully to the Black diaspora in particular, the African diaspora. Let us actually think about how the racial subjugation and the space of racial capitalism that is the contemporary Mediterranean Sea has its own longer history of African presence in what we're calling Europe and required that presence for Europe to be even possible. But it also is to say, let us attend fully to our own stories and acknowledge narratives that have been fractured away from one another. And so the Black Mediterranean most clearly is a way for me to think the relationship between Europe through Italy, but also many other national configurations like France, Spain, Britain, who is not in the Mediterranean in a geographical sense, but is involved in the Mediterranean in a colonial sense how those powers acted on the Mediterranean Sea as a geography, but also how they interact with the people and the site of exchange and encounter through colonization, through occupation, and other sites of antagonism that we see today in a contemporary sense through the crisis of migration. To say it in a different way, that's a way of saying that African Americans have culture, Jamaicans have culture, Black people in Britain have culture, but there also is something relational that brings those cultures together. And so there might be similarities, there might be overlays and overlaps, there might be some shared shorthand, and that's a way to think about diaspora in a broader sense.
Essay's line of inquiry challenges us to ask, what if the migrant crisis, as we hear about it in the media, isn't actually a crisis of migrants, but a crisis on how migrants are treated at the border? How could such a seemingly small shift in terminology redefine the problem? These questions are no longer rhetorical. It's now impossible to discuss Essay's work without acknowledging the almost incomprehensibly vast differences between the Black Mediterranean migrant experience and that of the other, even more contemporary migrant crisis unfolding before our eyes. In the first three weeks after Russia's invasion, over three million Ukrainians fled to neighboring European countries to be met with open arms. Compare that with the discrimination of black and brown people fleeing Ukraine, or the response to the less than two million people who arrived by sea from Africa and the Middle East over the course of nearly seven years, leaving behind everything they have ever known with the hope of a better life, only to be confronted by the violent policing of the state. The concern immigrants from Africa and other people of color who've called Ukraine home now, as millions flee the war-torn nation, there are accusations of discrimination towards these refugees. And this thing to hear earlier, who tried to get on the train and wasn't allowed to get on the train. We are told that they are only allowing, uh, they are not allowing the blacks to get on board. If you're a black and then you go there, you're wasting your time. So we didn't even like. If we ever thought these migratory currents were immune from the racial hierarchies that have long informed who is considered human and citizen, recent events tell us another story. What Europeans, white Europeans in particular, love to do is act as though race comes from America. Race is an analytic that we can mobilize when thinking Blackness throughout the Atlantic and its cultures. So too for the Mediterranean, but it's not as though we can say race is an American phenomenon. And while we saw through the Black uprisings that became global in scale, we also saw European forces saying that's a pandemic of its own right, right? This race talk that is coming from America and coming all over here, we don't have that problem. When actually the problem comes from Europe itself. And this is why I say it's a crisis of migration, but actually a crisis of European white supremacist identity, because the ships that went to the African continent and went over bringing Black people to across the Atlantic were European ships. So they exported Black people coercively and violently, and they also exported um, the fact of Blackness, as Fanon will talk about it. They exported race and racecraft. In 2021, 121,000 migrants crossed the Mediterranean. As I look out of the Atlantic from a small atoll in the Florida Keys, I think how that same year Florida detained 1,316 Cubans, Haitians, and Dominicans who made their own perilous journey across the Florida Straits. Others were turned away by the Coast Guard before reaching land. Some lost their lives before ever making it to shore. And a lucky few started new lives here. Well, I think living in Miami, one is particularly aware of movement and migration because you can wake up here on any particular day and hear that um, a boat has landed on the shores and that boat might be coming from Haiti, from Cuba, from the Bahamas. So the idea of migration, you know, this is a very, I think, transient city and a lot of People flow through here, but also people remake their make their homes here. As did novelist, short story writer, and MacArthur Award winner Edwidge Dantecat when she remade her own home in Miami's little Haiti neighborhood, where she lives today with her husband and two daughters. Edwidge was born in Port-au-Prince during the Duvalier years. I want to, to get from Haiti the leadership of the Negro, of the Black world. When she was two, her father emigrated to New York City to build a better life for their family. Two years later, Edwidge's mother followed. Edwidge stayed behind and was raised by her beloved aunt and uncle in Bel Air, a neighborhood in Port-au-Prince, until she was 12, when she joined her parents in their new home in East Flatbush, Brooklyn. She went on to study Francophone literature at Barnard, 
received her master's in fine arts at Brown and published her first novel, Breath, Eyes, Memory, in 1994. Ever since, Edwidge has been one of the most prominent Haitian-American voices in literature. Edwidge's writing, including her family memoir, Brother, I'm Dying, and short story collection, Everything Inside, meditates on the tensions between the sea as a source of life and possibility, as well as a source of ruthless and unpredictable violence. For me, and you know, and people often, I guess, intellectually tease me about it. I'm obsessed with the ocean and the way that I think Zor- it was Zora Neale Hurston who said that the sea is memory, and you know, Derek Walcott said the sea is history. Starting with the ways that we were brought from our mother continent to to these parts right of the world, it was through the ocean and the great millions and millions and millions of our ancestors who lie now at the bottom of the ocean, those who didn't make the Middle Passage, right? The idea of echoes in the Middle Passage and the migrations we see today, the migrations of the so-called boat people who are leaving their homes and doing these these journeys always bring me back to, you know, thoughts of the Middle Passage. For Edwidge and for many others, whether in the port cities of the Mediterranean or in the island life of the Caribbean, the sea is not a backdrop. It is a significant character of everyday life. As a character, the ocean is a place of work and pleasure, a space of passage and displacement. It is also a site to think about identity beyond territorial designations. Many of her characters cross the sea and experience the same violent structures that permeate land. In Edwidge's short story, Children of the Sea, two lovers write letters to each other, one adrift with 36 other passengers bound for Miami, and one still in Haiti. The story illustrates the limbo that identity enters into during the transoceanic journey. I don't know how long we'll be at sea. There are 36 other deserting souls on this little boat with me. White sheets with bright red spots float as our sail. There's a pregnant girl on board. She looks like she might be our age, 19 or 20. Her face is covered with scars that look like razor marks. She's short and speaks in a sing song that reminds me of the villagers in the north. Most of the other people on the boat are much older than I am. I've heard that a lot of these boats have young children on board. I'm glad this one does not. I think it would break my heart watching some little boy or girl every single day on the sea, looking into their faces, reminding me of the hopelessness of the future. It's hard enough with the adults. It's hard enough with me. I used to read a lot about America. I'm trying to think to see if I read anything more about Miami. It is sunny. It doesn't snow there like it does in other parts of America. I can't tell exactly how far we are from there, We might be barely out of our own shores. There are, after all, no border lines on the sea. Edwidge's work shows us how, from the Caribbean to the Mediterranean, those who have crossed the ocean or live by it are entangled with the sea in their daily lives, while also having deep ancestral connections to it. Well, I mean, in a way, I think, in so many ways, when we search and dig for it, Our ancestors left us, you know, imprints of ways to connect all of this. And Haitian Creole, for example, if you say that someone is Lot Bordeaux on the other side of the water, you can either mean that they have migrated or that they have died. And so for me, when I think of even the disbursement of of our ancestors, you know, throughout the African diaspora, then with our, our emerging differences based on where we landed, but also our similarities in terms of like sort of that, how beautiful a shock of recognition it is if I go to the Carolinas and see the experiences of, of Gullah people or read their history or see that gorgeous movie by Julie Dash, like Daughters of the Dust and think, oh, my grandmother did that and how that feels like finding a relative across time. And it's something very, very strong when you experience, because I think part of the the emotional resonance of it 
is that then you feel like, oh, they didn't take everything away from us. They didn't just divide us completely with languages and locations and all these tools. But there's still something that's sort of unbreakable in our ties. And even if it's some small thing sometimes, like gesturing, right? Like some movements that we make that people are like, oh my God, I've never seen anybody do this, but my grandma or my mother or... Well, and if you see that in a market somewhere across the world, there's something very powerful about that. There's just some things that are unerasable. <laughs> and, and I think for continuity, like if you have children, that's powerful because you think, okay, there's going to be something that resonates for them. My daughter is going to be able to go to Port-au-Prince or with her children one day and they'll be like, I know that forehead. <laughs> you know, I think that's an amazing thing. Hearing Essay and Edwidge in conversation with one another allows us to tease out the resonances across space and time between these forced migrations and the transoceanic cultures that have emerged as a result. Essay's work with the Black Mediterranean adamantly reclaims the cultural touch points that have been forcibly eroded in an almost visceral way. Because I talk very explicitly about Black activists in Italy and throughout the Mediterranean, Black writers in Italy, of Italy and throughout the Mediterranean, I think a major takeaway is that Black people exist here, <laughs> that Black people exist in a, in a way where they can claim their presence for much longer than mainstream, specifically Eurocentric narratives allow. For me, this has been also transformative work in making sure those voices are amplified and uplifted so that when we have conversations about citizenship and belonging, it's not just who has been here the longest and who can wait until they're 18 years old without leaving if they're born here to apply for citizenship. It really is to say Black people have lived here. They are of this place. They form what we call Italian culture. They make what is named European culture, and we need to sort of completely transform how we are talking about things like identity when we assume that Europe is a place of whiteness and Italy is a space where whiteness comes from. Where Essay's approach is profoundly tied to a sense of place, Edwidge describes the Black Atlantic diasporic experience as one of placelessness. It's being migratory, right? It's going from place to place, which started with, again, when we were brought here from Africa to different places. And now there are young Haitians who leave Port-au-Prince, fly to Chile or Brazil, and then walk across maybe 10 or 11 countries through the Darien Gap to come to the southern border of the United States to be deported back to Haiti. So that precarity, right? of migration, which I think there will be more and more people feeling over the years to come, driven by certainly by climate. But that precarity is strong. It's very strong for a lot of us. It's very real. So could the sea be a physical space that allows cross-cultural identity to exist in tandem with the feelings of placelessness that diasporic identity can bring? I think the ocean could physically be that space looking back, certainly. Historically, it has been. It's the place that we were forced to cross to come here. It's now a space of migration, of getting out. It's indigenous culture. It was the place where people went between islands. Essay also makes those connections to indigeneity and reminds us that the Black Atlantic of Edwidge's fiction and the Black Mediterranean essay studies are not analogous but rather work together to offer a fuller understanding of transoceanic identity. I can think about like Florida's migration crisis better or the one on the on the border where I live on Tongva land on the California Mexican border also knowing that I'm living literally on Mexico and then also on Tongva land right these overlaid histories on top of each other I can think about that when I think about how Europe is also overlaid onto other cultures and experiences through colonial and occupied forces. And I cannot think them without each other. Miracle. 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 
Bitch, the cumbered flesh, the cumbered crescent moon, floating a contrary flesh, body, our shores, sulking steel drum that lives hollowed favor my own. We tend to approach the ocean as the absence of place, a place between that divides people and cultures. But through both Dantica and Smythe's work, we can rethink the connections forged between your feet brushing the Atlantic Ocean on a Miami beach and the same ocean touching a boat carrying people searching for home, safety, and opportunity on new shores. We are connected both physically and philosophically touching the same sea. So picture the sea as a dreamlike body, malleable and impressionable. Consider all the trails left by boat journeys across its surface for a minute. All of the ripples in the water's surface they left and the legacies that trail behind. All of the overlapping waves that stem from the movement and migration of people, forced or voluntary. What if there was a way of mapping the impact of so much movement on the ocean through those countless journeys, impressions on the people who undertake them, and the shores they land on. In our next episode, we'll build upon Edwidge and Essay's frameworks of transoceanic identity to illuminate the ways in which indigenous communities relate to ancestral forms of knowledge bound to the sea, and how these perspectives might radically change how we view the future. Water having a kind of memory, I think, is something that we see in so many different cultures, that water captures memory and that water itself has a memory. So all over the world where waters are being dammed or the courses of water are being changed, the indigenous people of those places understand that eventually water will remember where it originally flowed. Tomorrow is the Problem is produced in partnership with Podfly Productions. This episode was produced and written by Isabel Lee and me, Donna Honarpiche, and edited by Francis Harlow. Our showrunner is Jocelyn Aram. Nina Pollock is our sound designer and mixing engineer. Special thanks to our guests, Edwidge Dantecat and S.A. Smythe, for generously sharing their readings with us. Thank you as well to Martine Sims and KCET for the clips of Sims reading her manifesto. And thank you to the South Florida Folklife Center at the History Miami Museum for the audio they shared of Caribbean percussion traditions in Miami. And thank you as well to Bruno Hunger and Gregor Huber for letting us use their song Junk as our theme. I'm Donna Honarpiche. Thanks for listening.